Nowhere in this very early first century work do we discover the Pauline ideas of atonement and redemption through Jesus' sacrificial death, nor do we encounter the Johannine idea of the eternal Logos. The Didache affords us priceless evidence. Greetings and good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Blogging Tawheed. Have you heard of the Didache, pronounced Didache? It's an important early Christian text that was ultimately left out of the New Testament. Nevertheless, it's a fascinating first century witness to non Pauline Christology, also known as the teaching of the Twelve Apostles. So, what is the Didache? Who wrote it? And when was it written? And most of all, who was Jesus for the Didache community? These are some of the questions I'm going to attempt and answer from an academic perspective with some historical references, of course. To begin with, when Matthew 28 verse 19 is mentioned as a forgery added to the canonical Gospels, Christian apologetics always respond with verses from the Didache, chapter 7, verse 2 specifically. Even though it was excluded from the canon and was deemed not sacred enough to be sacred. I'm not sure what criteria the Church Fathers used to determine what qualifies a document as the Word of God. Therefore, this series should serve as a critical analysis to compare the Gospels to one of the oldest documents discovered in 1873 and published 10 years later in 1883. The word didache comes from the Greek word related to doctrine, didactic, meaning teaching. The didache is a controversial document, just like the four canonical Gospels. It was written anonymously. And this is a scholarly consensus that the writer or the writers of the Didache are unknown. Yet I believe we can still draw a logical conclusion from some things about the author's identity itself. Although no one knows whether it is one book or several documents that have been cut and pasted together when it was written. It is, however, a document of the early Christian movement that has peculiar Judaic characteristics, which implies that the audience or readership was of a Jewish rather than Gentile background. In fact, there are many themes in this document that parallel the writings of the Hebrew Bible and other early Jewish sources making it carry the Jewish fingerprints. For example, the entire Dedicate can be divided into four parts, which most scholars agree were combined from separate sources by a later reductor. So the first is the two ways, the way of life and the way of death, chapters 1 through 6, and there is a great difference between the two ways. These two ways idea is found in Deuteronomy, but it's also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The second part is a ritual dealing with baptism, fasting, and communion, chapters 7 through chapter 9. Now, if you have been watching my videos, if not, I would recommend watching my videos and subscribe, please. Recently, I've been talking about the baptism formula in Matthew 28 verse 19 as part of a series of the fabricated Trinity verses added into the Bible. And chapter 7 of the Didache mentions the baptism. I will get to this point at the end of this series, inshallah. The third part of the Didache speaks of the ministry, how to treat apostles, prophets, bishops, and deacons, chapter 11 to chapter 15. And the final section is chapter 16, which is a prophecy of the Antichrist and the second coming of um, Jesus. The ethical teachings of the Didache also have parallels in other Jewish sources. 
For example, the data key here says, speak well of the ones speaking badly of you, and pray for your enemies and fast for the ones persecuting you. Data key, chapter 1, verse 3. Similarly, in Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 17, we read, do not rejoice when your enemies fall, and do not you let your heart be glad when they stumble. The Dedeke also lists the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20, which no doubt make it a very Jewish text. Yet, Jesus is clearly important to this community as well. The separation into chapters, I believe, is quite arbitrary, and even the division into 16 chapters specifically was motivated by a desire to compare it to the Gospel of Mark, the shortest of the Gospels, which also has 16 chapters. What's interesting is that all these chapters explicate these commandments, first in words that reflect the teachings of Jesus, without naming or mentioning Jesus' name at all, especially as found in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 1. Then in a series of a positive and negative ethical injunctions in chapters 2 and 4. However, there remain a debate between Christian scholars on whether the Dedeke was a source used by the authors or whoever wrote the Gospels, especially Matthew and Luke. Some modern scholars believe that the Dedeke is almost always assumed to have coded the Gospels, or at least the traditions found in the Gospels, not vice versa. I doubt this is the case. It is undoubtedly. However, the Dedeke shares a lot of materials with the Gospel of Matthew, especially sayings from the Sermon on the Mount. There are sometimes subtle linguistic differences, and you'll see it in this parallel, the examples of the saying, do not give what's holy to dogs. Dedeke chapter 9 verse 5 and Matthew chapter ver 7 verse 6 is exactly the same in both texts. Matthew chapter 5 verse 39 we read, But if anyone should give you a strike on the right cheek, turn to him also the other cheek. Dedeke chapter 1 verse 4 we read, If anyone should give you a strike on the right cheek, turn to him also the other, and you will be perfect. The idea is the same, although the wording is slightly different. I would like to share with you what Clayton and Jefford says about this, who is a professor of scripture at St. Menard Seminary School of Theology. He is also the author of many books, including the sayings of Jesus in the teaching of the Twelve Apostles. He says, and I quote, The most reasonable assumption to make is that both Matthew and the Dedeke got their material from the same source, rather than one depending on the other. End of quote. Now, I do personally believe while there are significant similarities between the Dedeke and the Gospel of Matthew, there is also an increasing reluctance of modern scholars to support the thesis that the Dedeke used Matthew, part of it because the Dedeke teaches literally nothing about salvation by intellectual faith alone. It is er therefore considered to be not authoritative by the majority of biblical scholars, especially among the Protestants. As far as Jesus is concerned, there are explicit references to Jesus in the Dedeke. This shows us the Dedeke community's view of the nature, the role, and person of Jesus. Remarkably, in four of these references, Jesus is called God's servant rather than God's son or divine. Scholars call this a low Christology because it doesn't fit the Christian narrative. Because a high Christology, on the other hand, would mean that Jesus is equal to or one and the same with God, much as suggested in the Gospel of John. Although, 
if you read the Gospels with different attitude, with a critical lens, not from an emotional lens, you'll find that Jesus was not portrayed either a God, co-equal, co-eternal, nor a Son of God. Dedicate chapter 9 verse 2 states, We give thanks to thee, our Father, for the holy vine of thy servant David, which thou hast made known to us through thy servant Jesus. The repeated reference to Jesus as God's servant in the Dedicate makes Jesus' status equivalent to that of the ancient Hebrew prophets without calling him divine. Jesus is God's chosen one for the Israelites and yet fully human and not divine in the Dedicate. I don't know how anyone can read the Dedicate and ignore the fact that Jesus is considered a prophet of God, the Almighty, and not divine. There is a, no indication whatsoever in the deity of Jesus by the writers of the Dedicate. Nowhere in this very early first century work do we discover the Pauline ideas of atonement and redemption through Jesus' sacrificial death nor do we encounter the Johannan idea of the eternal Logos. The Dedicate affords us priceless evidence of an undeveloped Christology characteristic of the early Jewish Christians, which contrasts the highly evolved Christ mysticism of Paul and John. And it is important to note here as well that the Dedicate contain, contains no mention at all of Jesus' death or resurrection, even in the prayers for the Eucharist or the Communion. This serves to underscore even further the low Christology within this community. What matters about Jesus are his teachings and example. This informs us that this community, like early Christian communities did not consider Jesus anything other than a prophet, a teacher, and a servant of God. And we see this when Ignatius, or Saint Ignatius of, of Antioch, as he is sometimes called, ironically confirmed in his letters on the way to Rome to be brutally martyred, that the early Christian communities believed Jesus was a prophet and not divine. They didn't believe in the Trinity or all that complexity of the Church. At least Ignatius was aware of the fact that there were early Christian communities who did not believe Jesus had any other natures other than a man, a prophet, and a servant of God the Almighty. Of course, by the end of the 2nd century, Paul's Christology became dominant in the emerging Catholic Church and Jewish ideas about Jesus were rejected in favor of exclusively Gentile idea of a dying and a rising Savior God, so similar to uh, satirological patterns ubiquitous in the pagan world. In other words, the emerging Jesus cult resembled in many ways the pagan cults of the Roman Empire. <laughs> وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى ابْنَ مَرْيَمَ أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّيَ إِلَهَيْنِ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ قَالَ سُبْحَانَكَ مَا يَكُونُ لِي أَنْ أَقُولَ مَا لَيْسَ لِي بِحَقَّ إِنْ كُنْتُ قُلْتُهُ فَقَدْ عَلِمْتَهُ تعلم ما في نفسي ولا أعلم ما في نفسك إنك أنت علام